I know, I'll do culture and get everybody to be friends and want to work together in a bipartisan way. Oh, shoot, that doesn't work. They say they want to work together in a bipartisan way, and then they always vote the same way. That's our special guest today, Catherine Gale, founder of the Institute for Political Innovation and co-author with the renowned strategist Michael Porter of the insightful book, The Politics Industry. I know, I'll do policy. Oh, shoot. Everybody knows the good policy. They just don't have the political will to do it. Join us today as we look at our frustrating politics with an original, clear-sighted, and maybe even optimistic view on how to reform things. This is The Purple Principle, a podcast about the perils of polarization. I'm Robert Pease. And I'm Emily Corsetti. And that view looks at politics as an industry, specifically a duopoly of two major parties— Republican and Democrat, elephant and donkey, red and blue, locked in a zero-sum battle. And yet, through all kinds of rules, norms, and perverse incentives, both parties are pretty much assured of survival for something like forever. Which, as you'll see, is a huge part of the problem. First, though, let's get to know Catherine Gale, starting with the basics like how to pronounce her name, where she's from, and her tolerance level for a pretty lame joke or two. I also wanted to make sure we're pronouncing your last name correctly. It's Gail, is that right? Gail, just like the woman's name. And you're originally from Wisconsin? I am. So we're based in New Hampshire, you know, live free or die. And Wisconsin had some sort of contest for a new state slogan, maybe a license plate at some point. Uh And someone suggested eat cheese or die. (laughs) I did not know that. Was that you, by chance? No, I wish it had been. <laughs> but amazingly, it did not win. So Well, and I don't know if you know this, but before my new career in political innovation, I ran a you know $250 million food manufacturing company, and we made cheese. Yeah, we saw that TED Talk, oh, and we knew that. And you mentioned that in the book, which we really benefited from. So let's start with the premise of the book, looking at politics as an industry, a very original premise. Did that just come to you as like a eureka moment or had it been brewing for a while? Rob, it was a eureka aha moment. And it came about only because I was not in a career in politics. I ran this food manufacturing company in Wisconsin. And I was in 2013 working on a classic you know, for-profit business strategy project using all of the classic tools. And so everybody who got their MBA learns these same ways to think about corporate strategy. And one of the things you do is use the five forces that, that a professor, Michael Porter of Harvard Business School, created decades ago. And they're the gold standard for understanding competition in industries. So I was analyzing the competition in my industry, and it was eureka as I was going through, I would say my brain split in half, and half of me was about cheese, and the other half was saying, oh my goodness, that is how it is in the politics industry. There's high barriers to entry. Oh, the customers have very little power. Oh, look at how much power the suppliers have. And it was only later when I wanted to bring other business people into this effort on political innovation that I determined it would be helpful to write it up, to show this logic of the politics industry, because it not only explains what's gone wrong, it's a really good basis for understanding what we can most powerfully do to alter the dynamic. Well, that's interesting because I'm afraid a lot of people who may have had a similar aha movement in private business have said, I've got to get elected because there's no competition there. (laughs) So we're glad you went in a different direction with that. Rob, could I say quickly, that's only because I first had that other aha moment, which is to say, not so much that I should get elected, but I only came to understanding the industry after basically taking several detours, which I talk about as my five stages of political grief. And finally, It was Mickey Edwards, former Republican congressman, 
from Oklahoma who had written a book called The Parties Versus the People. And in it, he says it's the system. And I've always been a systems thinker. I think it's fascinating that I took years and needed someone else to tell me that in politics, it's also the system. And then once I knew that, that opened the way for later when I was doing my strategy project, because that was about 2010, maybe that eureka of the system. It opened the way towards my being able to see it as an industry. Bloomberg is going to spend well over $150 million of his own personal Biden money. will be the first candidate in history to raise $1 billion from donors. The 2020 election cycle is by far the most expensive campaign year in history. Outside groups have already spent $2.5 billion. Nearly $11 billion. Nearly $14 billion total. The politics industry takes in more and more money, but does less and less for you. Kind of like your not-so-favorite cable and internet provider or utility company. Except our red and blue duopoly controls so much more of our lives. Like how much tax you pay, how that money gets spent, and the policies that shape our energy, environment, healthcare, transportation, education, finance, and a whole bunch of other industries. As Catherine mentions, her co-author on this book is Michael Porter, the renowned Harvard Business School professor, author of 12 books on a wide range of subjects. Here he is explaining his most famous piece of analysis, The Five Forces of Competitive Strategy. The five forces say that, yes, you're competing with your direct competitors, but you're also in a fight for profits with customers uh, who have bargaining power, suppliers who can have bargaining power, new entrants who might come in and kind of grab a piece of the action and substitute products or services that essentially place a constraint or a cap on your profitability and growth. And that's what Catherine Gale is referring to when she mentions the suppliers in the politics industry. That is, the parties and politicians have so much power, but the customers, that is the voters like you and I, have oh so little power. Catherine also mentions former eight-term Republican Congressman Mickey Edwards of Oklahoma as an important influence, talking here about the unintended consequences of an electoral reform during the progressive movement a century ago. In the progressive movement, you know, it was obviously a correct decision to give the people more voice, not closed rooms, you know, with, with a few people smoking cigars deciding, you know, who's going to be the nominee. But the unintended consequence is because most Americans don't vote in primaries. They're not aware there are primaries. They stay home and the extremes dominate who can be on the ballot. If we saw that a small group of people could keep others off the ballot in Peru, we would condemn it, you know, but that's our system. Edwards was a founding member of the Heritage Foundation and a consistent conservative. He represented Oklahoma's 5th District from 1977 to 1993. But in recent decades, he's been a strong advocate for political reform and a frequent critic of his own Republican Party, culminating in his recent decision to become an independent after the January 6 Capitol riots. Catherine Gale describes herself as a former Democrat who is now a nonpartisan, or in her words, politically homeless. We asked how that homelessness contributed to her book and to creating the Institute for Political Innovation. The homelessness created my look at why was I homeless? Why was, not just me, but why were so many of us homeless? Why are we dissatisfied with the choices that we have in this industry that is so important to all of our lives? We're not used to disliking the choices we have in our lives quite so much, which is to say competition, our capitalist system, does a very good job of continually improving products and services that are available to us as customers because competition pushes for that improvement. And so that's why I got into the work is because I was dissatisfied and so were so many people. Fascinatingly, and I'm sure you know this, right now, all we talk about are Democrats and Republicans, right? And yet, 25% of the country identifies as Republican, 25% of the country identifies as Democrat, and 50% most recently now identify as independent. And actually, we're only talking mostly about what Democrat 
primary voters want and Republican primary voters want, which is a yet smaller subset of those two quarters of the population. And Emily, we should say now that the most recent Gallup poll prior to Catherine's interview did have this high watermark for indie voter identification of 50 percent. An amazing number. But it does go up and down month to month. And in fact, went down to 42 percent the following month. But her general point is perfectly valid. We don't hear about indies. Here's how we covered this issue early on in season one with our 40 million missing episode. Independents are like the agnostics in the National Church of Us vs. Them, Blue vs. Red, or Red vs. Blue. In the media realm, independents have no cable channel. And when was the last time you saw an independent commentator on a major network? Democratic. On the right. Democratic debate. Conservative. Democratic. Republican senator. Democrat from New York. Lead over the Democratic field. Republican presidential candidate. Independents are largely missing from high school and college textbooks and classroom discussions. And in many states, independents are excluded from the primary voting booths. But while third parties and independents are largely MIA today, they were very much a part of the progressive era a century ago. And Catherine's home state of Wisconsin was at the center of the action. So let's hear about some of Catherine's heroes from that period of time when a broad coalition of Americans pushed through a bunch of political reforms, including four, count them, four constitutional amendments, which is inconceivable today. And when we briefly had just a bit more than the two traditional parties. Teddy Roosevelt is one of my heroes. I have a three-year-old son and I finished writing my original report in the three months after he was born, he basically slept on my lap and he is named Teddy for Teddy Roosevelt. I deny that the American people have surrendered to any set of men, no matter what their position or their character, the final right to determine those fundamental questions upon which free self-government ultimately depends. The people themselves must be the ultimate makers of their own constitution. So I have no hero, you know, of the progressive era greater than Teddy Roosevelt, but I'll give you my second would be Robert La Follette, fighting Bob La Follette because he's from Wisconsin and that's where I'm from. And Wisconsin was one of the states that really led the way in the progressive era. Men must be aggressive for what is right if government is to be saved from those who are aggressive for what is wrong. Which is to say that we in our democracy have already had the experience a hundred years ago of looking at how things were going in the country and saying, oh, it's not really working how we want it to for the majority of people. So let's change the rules of the game in politics And that will create a situation where our public policy changes in a way that in the case of post-progressive era, you know, really unleashed a wave of growth. So it's time to have a new progressive era. I'm sure your listeners know that that doesn't mean liberal. That just means, you know, move things forward. Moving things forward, a new broadly based progressive era, ambitious stuff in our polarized times. In the next part of the interview, we'll get to hear some of Catherine's main ideas for breaking the duopoly stranglehold on our politics and actually getting things moving. But first, a really quick review of that first progressive era in the United States from roughly 1890 to 1930. This movement cut across party lines and did an awful lot to improve things for a huge number of Americans at work, at school, and even at the dinner table. Progressives helped give women the right to vote. And they made it possible for regular citizen voters to directly elect U.S. senators who were previously elected by legislatures in many states. Progressives also led the way in establishing a modern regulatory system, including an independent Federal Reserve, and the creation of the Food and Drug Administration, energized by Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, on the health risks of the unregulated meat industry. She also mentioned her son's namesake, Teddy Roosevelt, who's known for many things, like establishing the national park system as president, and then running the most successful third-party campaign for president in modern history, 
earning 27% of the popular vote and 88 electoral college votes. In that 1912 election, and this was before term limits, Roosevelt ran to regain the presidency on the Bull Moose Party ticket after officials from his own Republican Party denied him the nomination. And sure, photos of Roosevelt hunting big game on safaris don't make for a huge Instagram following nowadays. But in his own time, he was a major voice for breaking up the hugely powerful bank, railroad, and other monopolies and duopolies, which were called trusts at that time. In her own plight Wisconsin way, one century later, that's what Catherine Gale would like to do as well. For Catherine, it's not breaking up. It's more like shaking up, or at least waking up, our beloved two-party red versus blue duopoly. You know that song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places? I always, if I could sing, I would sing that, which is in a sense, we're looking for a fix to our politics in all the wrong places. The real place to look is at the incentives that are driving the behavior and therefore the results that we're getting, or in most cases, not getting out of, for example, Congress. It's the only industry I can think of where those people in the industry playing that game, their jobs and their revenue in the politics industry are the ones that make the rules that govern that industry. Like the politicians are the ones who set the fundraising limits. The politicians are the ones that in most cases dictate and create the rules of how the elections are run. And so they keep altering the rules and setting them in a way that benefits their own private organizations and their their consulting firms, their media firms, their campaign firms, et cetera. And those people keep doing better and better while the customers are doing worse and worse. Which is certainly true, but also a bit perplexing. The U.S. is so innovative in many ways in business and culture and way less so in politics. So why do you think Americans have put up with this for such a long time? So my own experience of why did I put up with it, why did I not see it, is because I think we were taught a certain you know, sort of idealized view of the United States. And by the way, I am the biggest fan of the Constitution, of our founders, of the what I always call the greatest political innovation of modern times, which created America in the first place. And we grew up in a time when America was very, so many people alive today, when America was very ascendant and it seemed like everybody was going to follow our democracy. So we just didn't think it was something that was living, that needed to be fixed because it didn't used to, quote, need to be fixed or we didn't think it did. And the degradation has been slow. So it's like we've been frogs in that boiling water as it's as the water's been heating up to boiling. Yeah, well, let's turn to another important topic, which is legislative machinery. And you have the example of the Hastert rule. So most of us don't really know so much about the legislative machinery. We just remember Schoolhouse Rock and how a bill becomes a law. And it's so much not that. The Hastert rule is an example of where Party, partisan of control has really co-opted the way laws are made for the purpose of benefiting the parties instead of results in the public interest. And what the Hastert Rule says, and it's not written down, it's a tradition, it should be called the Hastert Tradition, but it's the Hastert Rule. And it says that no Speaker of the House from either party will allow a vote on the floor of the House unless a majority of the majority, which is to say a majority of the Speaker's party, wants that bill to pass. And that means that legislation supported by a majority of the House or a majority of the country sometimes has no chance of passing because there'll never even be a vote. And by the way, it's the same in the Senate. So that's fundamentally undemocratic. And those are the kinds of rules we have to look at. I'll tell you again, remember my song that I want to sing, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places? We are all looking at the filibuster 
as if that's the only piece of legislative machinery, the only rule that could or should be changed. I don't want to get into whether the filibuster is a good idea or not. I'm going to say there are other rules that we would absolutely have to change before we could have a functioning Congress. The be-all and end-all is not the filibuster. Ah, the filibuster. That's the rule by which any U.S. senator can silently, that is, without a floor speech, raise the threshold for passing legislation from 51 to 60 votes, which is way more difficult. And Emily, I don't know if we were looking for love in our recent filibuster episode. But we were looking for bipartisanship and how filibuster reform might affect polarizing trends in the Senate and in our nation's politics. Adam Gentleson, a former deputy chief of staff in the Senate and author of Kill Switch, he feels that the gridlock stemming from the filibuster contributes to hyperpartisanship and polarization. The reason that getting rid of the filibuster will, I think, help maybe us take baby steps as a nation to get out of this polarization is that it's very easy to see President Biden picking up small numbers of Republicans on some of the major priorities that he wants to pass, such as the infrastructure bill that he's going to bring up. It's very hard to see him picking up 10 Republicans and getting to this arbitrary 60-vote threshold. But our other guest, Richard Ehrenberg, a senior Senate staffer to three Democratic senators, has a very different view. If you think that excessive partisan polarization is the disease, eliminating the filibuster is going to exacerbate, not solve that problem. There's so many factors behind our gridlock and polarization. So we asked Catherine, for the benefit of our indie-minded listeners, what is the biggest issue to focus on in addressing our political duopoly? And without any hesitation, she pointed to the way we hold our elections and to her proposal for final five voting as a way to change the incentives. The biggest structural barrier to entry meaning the biggest reason why we don't have competition to the duopoly of Democrats and Republicans is the way we vote. So in the United States, we have plurality elections. And the point of plurality elections is the person with the most votes wins. And that seems logical, but it's really a problem because that means that we have something called the spoiler effect. So if you have a Democrat or Republican and someone new wants to come in, that person is almost always painted as a spoiler, as in, oh, don't vote for Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, because she'll just spoil the election for Hillary Clinton and help elect Trump. Don't vote for Gary Johnson, the Libertarian candidate, because he'll spoil the election and help elect Hillary. We're not spoilers. We're giving people a chance to vote for something as opposed to the lesser of two evils. So there's no better way to protect the status quo from a political opposition. And this is an effort to silence political opposition. So I guess we should drop out. Is that what you're saying? I was a third party candidate. I began yes. my career in yeah. running as a third party, getting 2% of the vote. But I think that before you cast a protest vote, think hard about it. And on your website, you have a great little bit of animation about the final five voting. The solution to revitalizing our democracy by reinstating healthy competition and ensuring accountability of elected officials lies in a combination of top five primaries and ranked choice voting. And with plurality voting, which we have currently, someone can win the election with just 28% of the vote. So could you describe how final five voting changes that? Final five voting is the combination of two specific political innovations, one in the primary election and one in the general election. In the primary election, we get rid of party primaries and implement a single ballot election where everybody runs on the same ballot and the top five finishers advance to the general election regardless of party, including independents, for example. And the second change is that in the general election, we eliminate plurality voting and we implement instant runoff voting, which uses a ranked choice ballot. 
the purpose of final five voting is to change the incentives that drive the behavior of our elected officials so that they are incented to deliver results. So in order to do that, final five vote addresses the two key structural impediments in our election system right now. And those two problems are party primaries push both sides so far apart that they simply, in many ways, are not permitted. They don't have the freedom to work together because every time they contemplate coming together in a consensus way, each senator, each representative has to think, oh, will I win my next party primary if I work with the other side to bring this consensus bill to fruition? And the answer for both sides is almost always no. The second thing final five voting does is it gets rid of plurality voting, which means it gets rid of the spoiler problem, which we talked about earlier. So it creates an opportunity for new competition, healthy competition, no more zero sum competition. And competition is key in any marketplace. So it feeds a feedback loop in a good way, it sounds like. Oh, I like that. Yes. <laughs> and so then can you tell us about the formation of the Institute for Political Innovation? I created the Institute for Political Innovation to bridge the gap between the ideas that I put out in my book, The Politics Industry, and I determined that we needed an organization to do that. So when people read the book, the last sentence actually says, I'm all in, are you? And literally, I received on Ju the evening of July 4th, I love the poignancy of that, an email that said, I'm in. And then in the body, it said, what are next steps? And that person has become a major player, a major political philanthropist in this. And that has happened more than once. And have you been able to get bipartisan support for your institute? And how hard or easy has that been? We absolutely have bipartisan support. I'm deeply committed to that. Political reform has traditionally always been perceived as a Trojan horse for party advantage of one side or the other. Reform in general, which is to say change in general, is historically more welcomed by Democrats. It's just a difference in the ideology of how fast things should change or not. So it is a bit more of a lift to bring conservatives on board, not because of the validity of the ideas, but because they are more hesitant and have a higher bar for experimenting with change in the political system. But the good thing is, in this case, final five voting, politics industry theory, and again, most importantly, the solution that we're really working on right now, final five voting, they're completely nonpartisan. There's no aspect of them that provides a benefit inherent to one party or the other. And it's also a proposal about healthy competition. I often call it free market politics, which you know delivers innovation, results, and accountability the way free markets do in well-functioning private industry. And so that's actually in many ways, you could say something that the conservatives often hold up as a key part of their ideology, the benefits of free markets. Can you tell us about the idea of the state electoral innovation laboratories and what you mean by that? So the Constitution gives each of the 50 states the power to make the rules for their own elections. So we can make the change to final five voting on a state-by-state -state basis and we will begin to see the results and benefit from the results of doing that when even only a small number of states make that change. 
So for example, as you know, Alaska in November of 2020 became the first state in the country to adopt this system design. Alaska passed by ballot initiative what I call a final four voting system. My earlier work in 2017 proposed four candidates, and I've only, you know, in the past year determined that five is more optimal. So Alaska passed final four through the amazing work of Shea Siegert, whom you, for example, had on your podcast and many other people and organizations. And we can see the effect already in the behavior of the federal delegation from Alaska. Alaska is definitely one of, if not the most, indie-minded state in our union. And they've certainly had some of the most indie-minded elected officials, including current Senator Lisa Murkowski and the last independent governor in the U.S., Bill Walker, who appointed members of both parties to his administration. Here's Emily and I reporting further on this from our season one episode, Declaration of Independence, Alaska Style. Alaska is a different kind of state in many ways. It's dependent on ferry transportation, prop planes, and all kinds of snow machines. And its size is different, even on a different scale you could easily fit the next two largest states, Texas and California, inside of Alaska, and you would still have room for Nevada and New York. Alaska is different politically too, and the most independent are nonpartisan electorate out of all 50 states. Nearly 57% of Alaskans do not register for one of the two major parties. And Alaskans may well have better, less polarizing elections having passed ballot measure two. That close vote has now been certified, making Alaska the first in the country to have both unified open primaries and ranked choice voting for statewide elections. But in the same year Alaska did pass an ambitious reform, an open primaries ballot measure came up a bit short in Florida, while ranked choice voting fell well short of passing in Massachusetts. We asked Catherine if she was surprised by these mixed results. I mean, not necessarily. You know, I think change is hard. And what I hope is that, and what I know is that those of us in this community are going to learn from the campaigns we don't win as much as from the ones that we do. So I don't know that I'm surprised by one in particular and not the other or something. It's, I'm not surprised that we don't have all wins. I mean, it's just not realistic, you know, to think that you're just going to have all wins. It seems like the fact that they're even coming up is a step in the right direction, though. Oh, no question. And I applaud everybody, you know, who's working on this. I mean, one thing I'll tell you is during the time that I've been doing this, the number of people and the quality of people that have come into this industry of political innovation is really exciting. The momentum is exciting. And the fact that citizens in states across the country are saying, huh, it shouldn't be this way. You know, we need to look at something different. I mean, it's the beginning of the progressive era of this century. So you've set out an ambitious agenda, obviously, with a bunch of different reform ideas. But if you had to point to the vital first step, like the most important first reform that will make the most difference in subsequent reforms, what would that vital first step be if you had to point to just one? Final five voting for federal elections is the single most important thing we need to do right now. Later, other reforms will be helpful, they'll matter, they'll make a big difference. But if we do not change what it takes to get reelected, there is no other set of reforms that would have a chance to alter the incentives. So then what would you say is the biggest obstacle right now in terms of that not coming into play? Final five voting is going to be adopted on a state-by-state -state basis. And in half the states, it can be done by ballot initiative. And in the other half of the states, it has to be legislative, which means their legislature has to pass the law and the governor has to sign it. And 
in order for each of these states to decide to do that by ballot initiative, vote of the citizens, or legislation, you have to start a campaign in that state. So the campaigns are starting. That's one of the things we really focus on here at the Institute for Political Innovation. We expect to see votes on a minimum of four ballot initiatives for Final Five voting in 2022. And, you know, what's going to keep it from happening is, you know, just the challenges of getting campaigns started and funding the campaigns and running them well. But it's nothing that isn't, you know, normally faced by new efforts. I don't expect it will come easy. I expect we will have losses between here and, you know, the promised land, but it's totally achievable. And when people come together, we're definitely going to be able to get this done. We'll be following the progress on Final Five voting and checking in periodically with Catherine Gale and the Institute for Political Innovation as they attempt to bring real competition and accountability back into our political system. But as Catherine notes, there's a lot of great groups and individuals and just plain positive energy behind these nonpartisan political and electoral reform efforts. So do consider getting involved. Two great places to start are the umbrella organizations, the Bridge Alliance, and the National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers, both based in Washington, D.C. Next time, though, we're going to turn away from gridlock in Washington to address the unfortunate topic of conspiracy theories and online formation of cults in recent time. We'll have three special guests on this episode. Donnie Whitsett, professor at the University of Southern California. Dr. Stephen Hassan, author of The Cult of Trump and a former member of the Unification Church. And also Rachel Bernstein, an experienced therapist for cult deprogramming and the host of the Indoctrination Podcast. I think cults do still occupy a physical space and it's just in the brain. And so there doesn't have to be a compound and it doesn't have to be that, you know, you can't get out or that it's where you live or you live with all the other members in a tiny little apartment somewhere and the control is constant. Many people are getting into very controlling organizations, just having never met the people in person. So I think the distance actually can create more of a bond because you fill in the blanks with what you want to be true about the group and what you want to be true about the people you're talking to. We hope you'll join us for that episode. Share us on social media, review us on Apple Music, and subscribe to our newsletter, Purple Principle in Print, via our website, purpleprinciple.com. This has been Robert Pease and Emily Cressetti for the Purple Principle team, Allison Byrne, producer, Kevin A. Klein, senior audio engineer, Emily Holloway, Research and Outreach, Dom Scarlett, Research Associate. Original music composed and created by Ryan Adair Rooney.